Hey boo, hey, welcome back to Firm Foundation. My name is Kay Hillman and today we are reading James chapter four. So excited, let's pray. Father God, I just come to you today asking for wisdom. Lord, I pray that you press on our hearts today exactly what it is that you want us to learn, know, and do from your word. We thank you for your inspired word. We thank you for your perfect word, that it corrects us, that it helps us to stay on the path to righteousness. God, we are not perfect and we know this. We know that you know this. And Lord, we just thank you for this gift of your living word. God, I pray that whatever it is that we need to receive today, we receive it through this word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Keeping it short and cute today, okay? We're gonna stay in the word. All right, let's get started. James chapter four, verse one. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? I love how James starts this chapter off with a question. I think this is the only book, only chapter in the entire book of James that he starts off with a question and he's questioning the Christians, right? He's questioning the believers, the ones that are going to hear this letter being read to them. He's asking them this question. What causes quarrels? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And really he's calling them to examine themselves. And the answer to this, he's going to tell us right after this. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So basically, James is like, okay, what's causing these fights? It's your own selfishness. It's your own desires. And remember, in chapter one, I told you in chapter one that that set the tone. Everything that he says in chapter one set the tone for all the big themes and concepts that he was going to talk about in the remaining chapters. He referenced them in chapter one. And so in chapter one, remember that he said that we are tempted by our own desires. He said that chapter one, verse 14, he talked about how we are tempted by our own desires. So now over here in chapter four, he's saying, okay, what is causing you to have fights and quarrels and all these ill feelings among you it's your own desires right he says your own passions the things that you want your own selfishness that is what causes fights among god's people verse 2 you desire and do not have so you murder you covet and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions okay i want to stop right here real quick because it's giving bar, okay? It's giving a bar because literally James is saying, okay, you want things so you do the wrong thing to get it, right? But more importantly, we don't have things or we don't get things because we don't ask God for them. But more importantly, the things that we do ask God for, we're asking him for the wrong things. We're asking him for things that are selfish, that are rooted in our own desires, our pride, right? We're asking for fame and wealth and fortune and not saying that those are bad things necessarily, but we talked about this in another chapter. I can't remember where, but we, um, James talked about how people that are rich, they struggle. Why? Because they have too much. Because when they have all these things, when we have all these material things, when we have the wealth, the fame, all that kind of stuff, we start to rely on ourselves. right? We become double-minded. We rely on ourselves, and it's basically what we can get, you know, human fleshly desires versus God's desire for us. So James is like, girl, why do you need some little strap or showing? Anyway, um, so James is essentially saying here, like, you are asking for all these things or as a rich person, you're going to struggle because you're constantly asking for things that are outside of the will of God, outside of what God wants for you. Verse four, he about to, you know, drag us a little bit more. Verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay, so right there, this is James just bringing us back together full circle and reminding us that we can't do both, right? We can't straddle the fence and want, you know, worldly desires, worldly pleasures and all that kind of stuff while on the same end serving God because it doesn't work that way, right? When we are so so, um, emboldened and so you know basically self-righteous in what we experience in the flesh it causes us to basically turn our backs from God right because we're not trusting and relying on him verse 5 or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us and yearns right here it just means that God hurts for us his spirit is grieved by us and it's almost like how you feel about your child like you don't want something to happen to your children or to someone that you love so you yearn for them like you're like oh my gosh I just I don't want this for them right I don't want them to experience this I don't want them to go down this path etc God has that same feeling towards us so he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made 
to dwell in us. Verse six, but he gives more grace. Amen. Can we praise God for that for a second? Like he gives more grace. And the Bible is full of just example after example of, after example of God's grace and mercy towards his people. Verse six, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes or some translations say resists. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay, so all we have to do is humble ourselves and we will receive that grace. Verse seven, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, here's the key, right? We have to submit ourselves to God and actively resist. Okay, remember I read in the last verse, it says God opposes the proud or God resists the proud. It's the same thing that we're supposed to do to the devil. We are supposed to resist the devil. We are supposed to resist or be in opposition to the enemy, right? Going back to what he said earlier, Earlier, we have to choose. Are we going to be in the world or, or are we going to choose God? Are we going to choose righteousness? So he's telling us, submit ourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So when you are actively resisting, when you are actively in opposition to the devil, he has no choice but to leave. He has no more authority or dominion over your life and over what you're experiencing, what you're going through. And you will not succumb to your temptations, right? To your desires. Remember, that's the whole thing James is telling us. He's telling us like, listen, you are going to be tempted by your desires. You have to submit to God and then resist the devil so that he can flee from you. Verse eight says to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Amen. Okay. This takes effort, right? Drawing near to God takes effort. It takes prayer. It takes fasting. It takes intentional time. It takes reading his word, understanding who he is and what he desires for you. So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And by double-minded, I was like looking it up here, double-minded, essentially James is telling us we need to be single-minded, right? We need to be, what he said before, submitted, focused, in tune with, or uh, submitted to the will of God. What does God want for us? What does God have for us? And we have to believe his word as truth. And so there have been multiple instances in James that he has has mentioned being double-minded and the grave effects of being double-minded. So he's just reminding us here, like, listen, you have to purify your hands. You have to purify your heart. You have to submit to the will of God. Verse nine, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now this part right here, when I first read it, I was like, wait a second, why am I, you know, why am I sad here? But I realized as I was exploring this a little bit more, what James is talking about here is this is us being convicted, right? So instead of us being boastful and living in our sin, living in our, you know, laughing in our sin, we need to mourn. We need to weep. We need to repent. We need to turn away. We need to turn away from that because that leads to our repentance. And essentially he's telling us to humble ourselves, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. So he will redeem us. Verse 11, do not speak evil or gossip. Some translations say gossip. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law. And remember in James chapter two, verse eight, he told us the law, the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. So verse going back a little bit. So the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Oh, okay. <laughs> James, we hear you. Okay, we hear you. How can we judge when we are not the ultimate judge, right? We didn't create the law. We didn't create anything, right? We didn't create anything. So who are we to judge someone else, to gossip or speak evil of someone else, right? Who? What gives us that right? What gives us that right? So James is like, oh, you might want to be quiet, okay? <laughs> because you have no power to save or destroy someone, right? We, and we don't. We don't have that power. And so James is reminding us here who the real judge is, right? God is the judge. Verse 13, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Now this part right here, when I was thinking about it, I was like, wow, this is what we do when we leave God out of our plans, right? We just wake up and we say, oh, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to do this thing. This is what's going to happen. And it's going to all work out, right? We made this whole grand plan. And James is like, okay, but you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, what tomorrow is going to actually bring, what kind of circumstances are going to come up. Like you have no concept of the bigger plan, the bigger picture, and you definitely haven't consulted God on this. So what are, what are you doing here? 
And then when he says verse 14, which I just like really laughed about because I just recently read Ecclesiastes, uh, in verse 14, he says, you know, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And I was thinking about Ecclesiastes because Solomon, King Solomon is like, you know, life is fleeting and, you know, we're, everything's a mist and a vapor and all that kind of stuff. And I was laughing because I was just sitting here thinking like, you know, when you really think about it, we're only here for a short time, right? Like we're only here for a short time in the grand scheme of God's big plan. So it's like, who are we to just create a plan for ourselves without consulting God first, right? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And what do they say? If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. It's like, yeah, we tell him our plans without actually consulting him to see what he has planned for us already. So verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. There we go. Whoop, there it is. Like, that's how we should plan. That's how we should do things. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. I actually have a friend who all the time when she tells me, like when we set plans or she says something to me, she'll always say, you know, Lord's willing, I'll be doing X, Y, and Z or Lord's willing, I'll be there. And whenever I read this verse, I always think about her because I'm like, I love how you respond. Like, that's so beautiful. Verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And I just love how James kind of closes out this chapter because essentially he's just saying to us like, hey, there's a right and a wrong way to do things. And if you know what the right thing is that you're supposed to do and you just choose not to do it, that is a sin. So I love chapter four because I feel like throughout this chapter, he's like giving a question and giving an answer, giving a question, giving an answer, or opposing a situation and then giving us the right way to do things or the right way to respond and I'm grateful for that because sometimes you know we all get in our heads and sometimes I be thinking to myself like okay well, what am I doing here am I supposed to be doing this like what's going on and so I love how not only is James warning us against being of the world but he's also giving us a guide on to how we should respond to things how we should navigate through life and that's honestly a blessing because sometimes your girl don't know right and I'm and I'm never going to know all of it so it's it's really nice to be able to just come here come to God's word and be like okay thanks for the reminder got it noted and and move from that direction this doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect or that I'm not going to succumb to my own thoughts and desires and temptations but it is good to know that like God has already accounted for that like God has already accounted for the K error and we're just going to vibe with that right I'm just going to vibe with that I'm going to do better I'm going to do what he says here and I'm going to humble myself before the Lord because I want the word to convict me I want to constantly be convicted so that I do better right so that I do better. All right, that's it for chapter four. I will see you in chapter five.